The Flash Season 3 introduced a wonderful little character named H.R. Wells, who was a writer of romantic sci-fi novels. Unfortunately, though, we, the audience, were only blessed with a brief glimpse of a single scene from one of his masterpieces. However, there is this AI talk to Transformer deal online that will write stuff based on a prompt. I have decided to do the multiverse a favor by using it to make something with what we briefly heard of HR's work and a title I pulled out of my butt. So, without further ado, HR Wells presents The Street vs. Mr. Reflective, Chapter 19, Close Calls. Just as the villain was about to go in for the fatal blow, Florence felt strong hands around her waist, lifting her like she was a feather. She was whisked away, the wind blowing through her hair, as her mystery hero finally set Florence down on a mountain. With each step, she grew dizzier, and Florence didn't think she could take much more before she lost her breath. But all of a sudden, she heard a voice among the wind. With a jolt, Florence looked down. There he was, Mr. Reflective, looming over her. Weary and exhausted, Florence couldn't believe her eyes. Who is this guy? I'll answer your question in a second, he spoke. But for now, we must catch up with my pet. She is in no condition to be out in the wind. Dress her in some warmer clothes, quick, and I will return shortly. Mr. Reflective disappeared into the shadows. In the meantime, Florence saw a purple puma playing by the playground, throwing frisbees to some nearby children. No, she cried out. I want to play too. The purple puma looked up as if she understood and bent down to help Florence get her heavy winter coat off. While she did that, the water pouch gave a slight shake and another two liters of water sloshed out onto the ground. By the way Florence and her puma friend were acting, Drew assumed that the purple puma was Ms. Malva. The gym leader of Wichita City, Florence waded out into the river, wriggling her fingers and toes to get rid of the snow that clung to them. She waded further and further out until the water covered most of her shoulders. She stood there for a while, looking down at her purple t-shirt that floated on the river. Once the water had reached her ankles, she turned around and started swimming towards the cave. What on earth are you doing? Don asked Drew, who was gripping his back tightly as the current was taking him towards the cave as well. The water is freezing. Don't worry, I'm getting out. But where are you going? I'm not going into that cave. Don and May shared a surprised look. Everyone stared at the two trainers who were too stubborn to give in. I'm the girl with the dark hair, right? Don said. May Mabel? The girl continued to look at the two. You're the girl with the magenta colored hair. Don said. The girl then looked at her. Oh yeah, you're Don. You were the leader of the pack. The one who was always there for the others. You never ran off. Always happy. You just didn't feel like it. You were a great person. Oh Don, you're so sweet. I always believed that I would lose my child too. It's the cruel thing that life is. But I have to agree with you in that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger and you are a beautiful person. And looking at Hunter's faces, you have found the strongest woman I have ever met. Don's eyes softened into a smile. Hunter, you make me proud every day. Thank you for being such a great daughter before leaning down and kissing her child and holding him close. Haley watched as the two bonded more and more. She was happy for the both of them, and most of all happy, her daughter was happy. If it is alright, I'd like to spend some time with them when I get back. And like my mom said, it may take me a few days to get out of the airport. She smiled at Hunter. I'd love to spend time with you as well, but I don't want you to be sad while I am gone. What do you say we get something to eat? This time it was Hunter who laughed nervously. It seemed like he was trying to fit it all together. Oh, uh, okay. He turned to the chair that he and Aki were sitting in. Oh wait, he looked back at his best friend. Hey Aki, you want to come with me and Pachan? Aki looked disappointed. I, I don't know, buddy. Hunter started to push the food around on his plate, making very visible effort. No, I mean with me, so we can hang out at the store and play in the sand and stuff. You know, walk around and stuff. It's kind of boring, to be honest, and really not my kind of thing. I'll call you, though, and talk to you about it. Sure thing. Summer smiled up at him. That would be great. Maybe we can have dinner or something when the store is open. It's open now and it's just me, so I'll be coming back later. Hunter said, looking a bit put out. Of course, Summer said, with a smile. Well, I should probably go, unless you want to hang out more. What do you do for fun? She asked, genuinely interested. You know me. I have a little movie theater on the side of the garage, he said, and I usually just drink and watch movies. How long have you been doing that for? Summer asked. About a year now, Hunter answered. I just clean it up and show it for a few weeks until it gets boring again. Cool. Well, it was fun talking to you, Summer said. Maybe I'll see you later. All right, you take care, Hunter said, smiling a little. Ruby looked away from the window, a little uncomfortable. Hunter then said, get some rest. All right, Ruby. He tried to keep it light, but there was something about Hunter's smile that made Ruby feel a little off. She got out of the car and got into the back seat. Her eyes shut and sighing. Ruby didn't know what she was feeling or what was wrong. She just couldn't get Hunter's face out of her mind. Hey, Ruby's eyes shot open. It was the first thing she had heard in what seemed like ages. Hey, Blake said, coming into her room. You're awake. Yeah, Ruby said, turning over. Feels better, though. She looked at Blake. You're looking a bit worse for wear. No worries, Blake said, climbing into the bed with her. How's your head? 
head? To be asked, not too bad. Blake grimaced. You know the worst part? What? Putting your clothes on. My head hurts, and my vision is blurry. Blake groaned. All I want is to curl up in a ball under the covers and go back to sleep. You're not going to be able to do that if you're helping me put this dress on. Blake stood up. Fine. This side. I'll go do some research. Great. Blake smiled. Blake, still blindfolded, felt her way through the small space. Finally, she found a set of double doors at the back of the shop and felt her way up to them. She could feel the gently swaying curtains, just enough so that she wouldn't bump anything. She opened the doors to see a brightly lit room of multicolored fabrics. I see you decided to come home after all, his mother said, smiling. Your father must be relieved. Your job isn't the only thing that you picked up here, she told him. You've learned some discipline, and if you continue to stay out of trouble, I'll teach you how to run the business. The two of them were silent for a long time before she spoke again. I'm proud of you, Brian. I always thought you'd be a lawyer. Then I thought you'd be a surgeon, but you surprised me with yourself. Don't forget about the code. You never know who's watching. I'd written the code as a private joke between us, but I did remember. It was silly, but I was drunk and knew I'd never remember it later. It was a short list. First, the hexadecimal. Second, the short series of letters. M plus W plus at. That's what my parents called me. M and W were my initials. The first two letters of my first name. And a symbol for the first letter of my last name. My father thought we should take out the hyphen, but he wasn't that keen on getting one of those hyphenate W's tattooed on his chest. Lawson. Isaac. PM. <laughs> Mother. Me. Hi, Mom. 21. May. 10. 0418. EDT. Dear Mom. This is it. The real thing. You have the whole vacation of a lifetime to enjoy and explore yourself. Find out what you really like. My good friends Anne and Kristen say I should go to the Caribbean. Why don't you take a class or something? You're so cool and mature. I need your support to start my own business so my parents will feel bad that I'm moving out. Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to be forward and ask you out for coffee. But since you already took up my lunch hour, I'm back. When can you start my new business? Talk to you later. Brody. Best. Brody back to Top Dear Brody. To some of my friends, you seem to have gone to the very extremes with your writing. You write yourself in the third person and use cutesy teen language that makes you sound much older than you, a 27-year-old. I think it's safe to say that the fact that you're extremely paranoid, you tell me that you can only trust me if you're a psychic probably isn't helping your case. What you need to do is to stick to what you do best, which is writing normal people letters to one another. I'd love to chat more about your apparent delusions, but I have a lot of writing to do for my job, so I must be off now. Regards, a normal person. P.S. So much for the preachers of the gospel of success. Now you can tell them all you need is love, and you can sell anything if you say it with enough conviction. Just try saying the words, love, peace, and progress out loud. I've worked too hard on you people to let them break me. They are trying to tell me it's time to give up now. That my dreams aren't going to come true, but they just don't understand me. I will prevail. I'll keep trying, trying, trying. The little fellow who has something against me is no match for me. I'll win. Three, like the sun in the sky, love burns brightly. Like the sun in the sky, it sets early. But when it comes, it's worth every sin. Four, I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. I know exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. Five, just because you're up doesn't mean you're up. Just because you're down doesn't mean you're down. Just because you're up doesn't mean you're up. Just because, A, Jade is lying and he's doing the same thing as the owner and hates her for it and is bullying her and may just be wishing it would end so easily as Harvey and Allie had forever. Hopefully all on his own because she is the worst. Seven, this is all Harvey's fault. Harvey wanted her to be happy. He knew you couldn't make someone stay for you. So he thought if he was a nice guy and he got her a puppy, that would convince her to stay. But he messed up because it's impossible to convince someone. Eight, you have a good girl inside of you and it is the prettiest, most precious thing in the world. But I don't think it's ever been trained to love another person like that. I just think that once she gets to know you and see that you're good to her, she'll come around. Nine, hitchhiker. Ten, I'm going to lock all the doors and I'm going to say I can't come out until the blizzard's over. Then I'm going to jump in bed with someone who doesn't have a blanket. 11. With you, I don't have to be afraid. 12. Love kills. 13. Take me out to the ball game. 14. Break up with me and then make out with someone new. 15. You guys might be yodeling on our adventure. Your kid might run off on you and not return. 16. On the back of a napkin, I wrote my phone number. Then I was too shy to give it to you, so you had to play Cupid. 17. You and me, we ain't never had no love. 18. You're the universe. I'm an extra asteroid. 19. I can't really explain why 
was wearing these boots. But they're important to me. Every day I have to wear them. Because I can't go out like this. They're not sexy at all. I don't have much to offer. I'm amazed. He's basically just telling me he's into booties. What's going on? Are these his good luck charms or something? I feel like I'm in a video game or something. Where the giant character is a giant girl. I'm not worried about love or anything. It's just funny. Because when I go shopping and try to find a shoe for someone, they're always like, You're such a man. The girl line drew a few chuckles from Glamour's senior fashion editor, Megan Reynolds, who later had her own PMS boyfriend. It's the galaxy of girl power. T she wore to a gathering of the National Organization for Women in Washington, D.C. My boyfriend, Chris S. Verone, a senator from Connecticut, was telling me that when he was growing up, he really wanted to be like Captain Kirk, but he wasn't too girly. Photographed by Charlie Walk last December.